Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times. And I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely. And that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, this is Randy Kay with the Heaven Series. I'm delighted today to have as my guest Steve King, who, well, his story is incredible. He was a Buddhist. He came from uh, South Korea, and then he uh, he really went through a, a cardiac arrest uh, event through a drug overdose when he went to college in the U.S. in Southern California, and then subsequent to that, he experienced hell, and he experienced this hellacious time that he's going to describe to us, and then. After that, God redeemed his experience in hell by giving him this tremendous vision of heaven that you're going to want to hear about, both hell and heaven. Steve, it's great to have with you, uh, with, with us today. Yeah. <laughs> it's, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Randy. It's an honor to be here. And, um, you know, it's all for the glory of God and Jesus. So it's a, it's a blessing. Nice to meet you, Randy. Nice to meet you, Steve. And so, well, let's begin with your experience. You were trained in Buddhism, and Buddhism is a religion that doesn't necessarily believe in a heaven and, or hell, as I understand it, and you can go back and forth and you transition. So uh, if you can just give us a, just a brief experience of your um, training and belief in, in Buddhism. Yeah, sure. Uh, both of my grandparents on my mother and father's side were very ardent Buddhists, and it wasn't a pure form of Buddhism. It was like a Koreanized version mixed with other spirituality. And I mean, I remember from the age of six, I attended these temples with my grandparents and was very curious about the existence of God, the purpose of life. Uh, is reincarnation real? Is eternal life real? And, and as a result of that curiosity, uh, I started to meditate and I asked the monks, like, how do I become like you? How do I become spiritually more strong? And, 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 you know, reach nirvana because that's the end goal of Buddhism. And uh, and sad to say, once you reach nirvana, you're all alone. You're, you don't need anyone else. So it's you're alone forever in eternity. It's kind of sad. But back then, that was the only version I was introduced to. So I was chanting from the age of six. Um, had a Buddha show up in my dream. Uh, he never said kind of kind of kind of odd now, now that I reflect upon it, that he never actually spoke. He would just float around. <laughs> Just like the statue, he doesn't say sits there, and um, and and yeah. So I was to it. Um, I remember taking weekend trips to the my friends. I would bring friends from Christianity to my temple. They were kind of weaker in the faith, and we would spend eight hours meditating, and I would feel something, but never had that full satisfaction that Christ gave me after. But it was a um, self developing self um, self 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 religion where. There's all these gods and no clear answer to what happens after you die. I think only Christianity offers a you know, full assurance of salvation. But all I had and my parents were really into it, but I was the most into it out of my family. So even in high school, Randy, I'd come home, meditate. I would meditate before I go, wrote down the laws. And, um, but, you know, it was never a, a fully satisfying experience. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you were raised in that. You went to school in South Korea. How old were you then, Steve, when you emigrated to the United States? And I believe you first came to Boston. Yep. I came to Boston at the age of nine to America. And like, wow, it was a huge blessing. I mean, back, back in those days, in the late 80s in Korea in 1988, um, Korean supermarkets were very small. It was still a developing economy, unlike now where it's top 10 GDP, whatever, and so forth. And I will walk into supermarkets and you have like hundreds of you know, cookies, drinks. I was like, wow, there's heaven on earth, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, that led to like an identity crisis because I was only a uh, Korean American there in the whole city almost, a very suburban part of, of Boston. I had um, friends invite me to like the Catholic church. I went to the, maybe once, because I got free food there. But uh, I was very not exposed to uh, Christianity back then. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you um, were in Boston, and then you ended up in Southern California. 
yep. uh, going to college there and then the university in uh, Southern California at uh, uh, University of California in Irvine mm -hmm. um, eventually. So when you initially went to college before going to the university, um, you were involved in drugs. Yeah. So from Boston, I went back to Korea, got more into Buddhism and came to California back in 1997 went to uh, Pomona College, which is a pretty, uh, a very good arts college back then. And, and though everybody had their goals and, and things like that, and I had mine, I think spiritually I was still empty, even as a Buddhist, especially as a Buddhist, I mean, and, and I started getting involved in drugs when I got there, like all the other party kids. And I was not the heavy drug user either, but in the summer of my freshman year, I moved into a house where everybody was doing drugs every day. Uh, not by choice. It was the only place I could live at the time and ended up uh, getting more heavily involved and then uh, eventually smoking a very powerful drug, which led to the incident. Mm. That powerful drug is called the death. Yeah, the street, the street word, Randy, is it the death bowl? The death bowl. And so that, <laughs> as I understand it in talking with you, includes just about every of the major drugs you can think of, heroin and methamphetamine, cocaine, yeah. marijuana, of course. Um, yeah, so exactly. all of these together. And I guess the uh, the death bowl really lived up to its name for you then. Yeah, yeah, it did. It's a street word. Uh, it kept me up for 10 days. Um, it, it's the heroin and the PCP that kills probably 50% of its users attempt suicide when they don't get another hit. I didn't know that. It actually looks like regular marijuana, but it's laced on top. And you only know it was because of the after effects. For a, a straight 240 hours, days in September of 1998, it lived up to its name. <laughs> wow, wow! So here you are smoking the death bowl, and you went into um, kind of a death spiral after that. Yeah, I've uh, I attempted suicide because I had an encounter with the devil. He didn't come to me with pitchforks and horns. I actually wrote a letter to my mom, Randy, saying, Mom, I think I'm going to hell. I'm going to die. I'm sorry I failed you. And she read it and she was crying. This was around the seventh day of me uh, staying awake. We pray more to Buddha, but the more we prayed, Randy, the less we had, the more warfare we had, right? We're opening more for me to come in. We didn't know that back then. Uh, we had no Christians in our family. And um, and yeah, so on the 10th day, I attempted to suicide. I found the biggest knife I could find in my kitchen. And the devil offered me a deal. I didn't know it was the devil. It looked, I thought it was the Buddhist God that I was serving my whole life. And he said, to offer your life to me, attempt suicide. I'll give you 50,000 less years of hell. Without Christ, it sounded like a good deal. So I, on the 10th day, I got on my knees in my apartment in Irvine, cut my hair and my stomach open. Uh, the cops ran in during, the, during that time because my mom saw me do it. I'm so, she's a good Christian now, but you know, she was traumatized by that. And she called 911, the police came, and they literally had to take the knife away. And that's when I had an out-of-body experience to hell. And I saw for the first time that hell is real, just like Jesus says in the scriptures and the gospels. Mm. So you literally made a deal with the devil. Yeah. Or a <laughs> Unknowingly, yeah. Unknowingly. And, um, and you went to hell. So I know that... Um, we don't want to edify or build up hell, obviously. Right. But this hellacious encounter was introduced to you through this uh, demonic uh, appearance manifestation to you. Well, uh, Steve, you had basically, it sounds like nowhere to go. I mean, uh, your religion that you were ascribing to at the time um, provided no answers to you. Exactly. Um, you probably cried out for those answers, but then but then you experienced this place that was hell. How did you know it was hell? And, and what did that appear to be to you? Yeah, so it's a really good question, Randy. I knew it was hell instinctively. I never even believed in hell while I was here on earth before that. Um, so when I cut myself open, I lost so much blood that uh, I was unconscious. I went into a coma. Um, it was eight hour surgery, but it felt like five minutes. I left my body instead of going up like the devil, evil Buddhist spirit promised. I was sinking to the middle of the earth, Randy. It felt like I was in a roller coaster elevator, just sinking. And the fear, anxiety, the pain, physically, spiritually, emotionally, condemnation, guilt, abandonment, fear was a hundred times anything I felt on earth. 
And when I landed, I looked around and I knew I made a mistake. For the first time in my life, Randy, I knew I was a sinner. Never ever thought, because in Buddhism, we're not taught original sin. Secondly, I knew I'm, I'm, I was never going to get out. I just knew. And I looked around. I was not. Um, every direction. Same status. The, 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 the demons were not little imps that talked to you in the cartoons, you know. Hey, eat the chocolate. No, these are big, big ones. You know? And I knew they ruled the place. And I knew I deserved to be there. And I knew I would be there forever. It was something that no human being should experience if possible. Mm. You know, we've had, yeah, yes, um, Steve, we, we've had guests who have been to hell and had hell experiences, uh, course, Brian yes. Melvin, uh, Ivan Tuttle and others, and they describe it as a place of absolute hopelessness and despair. And what yep. you just said was something that they shared, which is shocking to me. And that yep. is you actually felt like you deserved to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I was never taught the doctrine of original sin in Buddhism, but I knew it's where I was supposed to be without God. Uh, I had no thought of Christ on, still, but I just knew I was never going to get out of this place. I knew I made a big mistake, first of all, because that evil spirit disappeared talking to me just, you know, and I was all alone spiritually. And I felt um, it's the pain that you feel in hell is worse than I think any torture here on earth. Um, and it's just like Jesus said, it's, it's where the weeping and the gnashing of teeth doesn't stop, where the fires don't stop burning, just like he said, where the worm does not quench. Um, mm. It's a place made for the devil, I believe, but human beings who choose to follow him, go there with him. So, yeah, it's definitely not a place where God and his people you know, can dwell. <laughs> mm. yeah. Well, you know, and... I know a lot of people that have written into us and they said, you know, I just don't want to go there. And, yeah. You know, I, I gave my life to Jesus and I hear about these stories, but I want to make sure that I'm not there. Right. But um, it's interesting that those with whom we've spoken that have had that experience in hell actually believe that that was their place as, right. as saddening and as sick, sickeningly as right. that, as that may be. Right. Because there's no other hope that was was given to you outside of just a place that was apart from a God of of Jesus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, um, Steve, what happened then? So you're in hell. What got you out of that? that <laughs> yeah. So God is a timely. Jesus is a timely deliverer. Now is a day of salvation. Today is a day of grace. Christ says in Second Corinthians. What got me out was none other than Jesus himself. None of my Christian friends really preached the gospel to me. And I'm still so grateful that he delivered me from that because uh, he came through my mom's friends. Uh, my mom's friend who was a Christian saw what happened. My mom had no one else to reach out to. So she called her friend and she brought eight pastors and intercessors. And they were in the ER room next to the ER room praying for me. The operation was the doctor told my mom, the first operation didn't go too well to, to reconnect all the blood vessels that were caught. So they tried it again, and they said it was a miracle. They did a blood transfusion, and it was a miracle that um, they found the blood vessels that were cut. A specialist flew in at the right time. If he was like five minutes late, I wouldn't be here. Those no story, and, and it was Jesus who came. I didn't see him the first time, but I remember just hearing a very simple voice before I woke up. Uh, no more drugs, no more and I love you and I opened my eyes and I was in the ER surrounded by these and they said you want to accept Jesus I was like yes because <laughs> I was just I'm sorry just I Steve uh we had a, a blood there but so you were surrounded by angels no no no. I was surrounded by the Grace Church pastors and intercessors oh so they yeah. were interceding yeah they came because my mom's you? friend called them yeah my mom's friend called Hey, we got to go pray for this guy. It's my friend's son. He's Buddhist. He attempted suicide. He's in the ER. And they all came over. They didn't have to do that, but they did, I think, out of God's call. I believe it changed my faith. Uh, Calvinist, I don't know how that works, but <laughs> I don't think anyone does. But uh, it was a blessing, Randy, to open my eyes. And the first thing I heard was, you want to accept Jesus from the pastor standing bedside. And I think I said the sinner's prayer 10 times that day. I didn't want to ever go back. 
wow. to their place. So grateful to be alive. I was still very tired from the injuries and from the surgery. But I knew that I'd been to hell and back somehow. I just knew. And I knew I had to accept Jesus. <laughs> wow. You know that, um, and I believe that was the mother at the home in which you were staying, that she was a believer. And is that how, how, uh, how the church found you? Yeah, and she was actually friends with my mom, too, from high school, from the international ah, school. Yeah. And, you know, she's always praying for her son and their friends, our friends, drugs, go back to church. But, you know, they kept doing drugs. And I was like, I actually got saved out of that group, like really saved. You know, and, I, and then I'm going back to them saying, hey, we got to really become Christian. Quit the joys. And they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not Buddhist anyway, they were shocked. <laughs> I, I can imagine you're going yeah. back with like they're thinking, what happened to you, dude? You know, yeah, you're... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you wanna you wanna you wanna hit and, and you're 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 born again. You're <laughs> yeah, no more. I got the most high. We don't need anything else high. <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow. And what happened to your mother then? She saw this yeah. then and she was there in Southern California, had obviously emigrated as well from South Korea. Yeah. So what did she think of all this stuff? Because she's, she's from the Buddhist background as well. Yeah, she was very disappointed with the response of the Buddhist monks who kept saying during those 10 days that they cannot share in a which we thought was very, she was very disappointed. Buddha doesn't answer prayer. She heard my story, saw the Christians come to the emergency room so quickly with love, unconditional love. And she accepted Christ the next day. So she oh, became my. Christian, forced to throw out all the Buddhist statues, all the paintings that burned it up, ripped it in half, you know, destroyed the idols. And then, um, and then my brother got saved as well, because um, he saw it as well. And then, uh, then my dad got saved 10 years later. But my mom, she, she's a prayer warrior now. She prays every morning at 5 in the 5.30 a.m. It's because of her prayers that I believe I'm being used by the Lord. Uh, just She's so into Christ, just like she was into Buddha back then. We are so thankful. Um, she's a, she's so wonderful. She's such a wonderful woman of God. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like a, a mother who loves us enough to to really uh, you know discover the truth and and the truth the way uh, of Jesus. Uh, Amen, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the way, the truth, and, <laughs> and the life. And the life. Amen. And no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. Um, Amen. So, Steve, th this is a fascinating story, and it doesn't end here because there's kind of there's a very much a redemptive nature to to your uh, story, what God is doing. But I just have to say uh, that there, there you are alive today, and I think it's fair to say this because of the prayers of others who are praying for your life. Amen. And you weren't, it wasn't because of, of your belief. Obviously you weren't a believer at the time, oh. but they were interceding for you at your yeah. bedside. You, you should have died. I mean, you should, you should have never recovered from that. I mean, right. I've, I've been in the medical uh, space uh, most of my career from oh. the type of injury you had in the, the severed arteries, the bleed out rate is so high by the time you got to the hospital, um, you know, there's, you know, you, the loss of blood and, and having to go in and repair, uh, it just doesn't happen. So there was a miraculous right. healing. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Fair to say that the prayers of others, intercession change. Amen. I yeah. Amen. Well, you know, we've had, uh, Steve, others, as I mentioned, who experienced hell and it seems like God uh, gives those who suffer from hell because the being in hell itself kind of uh, causes post-traumatic stress uh, disorder, <laughs> you know, yeah. PTSD. PTSD yeah. Um, you know, hell. And just one question, and I'm going to, we're going to get to the part where God really releases you into heaven because it's, it's fascinating to me that the believers who experience hell always had this profound encounter in heaven it's almost as though god is using that yeah. to heal that ptsd Amen. from hell so yes. um so you had this did it did it torment you after you became a believer you're born anew 
in Christ, did you um, have any residual effect from, from certainly the injuries, but from this traumatic experience in hell? Oh, yeah. Um, not just physically, but it, spiritually, it was very draining. First three weeks or even a, I had this experience. Every person I saw, my question was, is he or she going to go there or not? Strangers, neighbors, people I'm just passing by. And, and it was very stressful because I felt like I, I had to tell them. And I couldn't imagine my loved ones there. And during this whole time, I'm physically recovering too. So the whole first few months as a Christian, I still have insomnia. I, you know, I still remember that vision as it happened you know, five minutes ago. It's so alive. But back then, it was even more alive. And yeah, it was traumatizing to know the reality of it. Um, you know, life apart from God, like, you know, it's like a fish without water or mm. without, you know, air. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's very, that's, that's uh, very true. What happened wow. Too. Well, you have a pastor's heart, obviously, going around and looking at people and uh, <laughs> yeah, Christ uh, fearful, so. maybe, but concerned. I don't know what the feeling was at the time. Like, you don't want them to go there. Did you yeah. ever feel having now that you're in, uh, a place where you're destined for heaven that uh did you have this fear of going back there or was that just wiped away uh in the beginning i knew i'm never gonna go i fully accepted christ and i felt the first love of jesus uh two months after i was baptized in the holy spirit and i slept like a baby and and all the nightmares i had even after that hellish vision appeared you gotta when you don't sleep for 10 days how it feels like I'm sleeping 10 hours a day and like 12 hours a day, I'm recovering emotionally, spiritually, physically. So did I think I would go back to hell? No, not in the beginning. Not that, but uh, I knew I was destined for heaven, that eternal life is secure. But even as I grew as a Christian and faced different warfares and met different people and made different mistakes, yeah, there were times when I thought the Lord forsook me, but, but he would always come back and his promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you, is very real. And he disciplined me a very narrow road of life where I confess my sins to the congregation. I confess my struggles and God always delivered and always got rid of that sin that I confess because he likes that. He loves that honest confession. Mm. Even though none of us are perfect, we do go from glory to glory and he's very patient, very merciful. Amen to that. And yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For those of us who have, <laughs> have gone through that, uh, that afterlife experience, we can testify to that. And let's go there. Um, yeah. because you had this profound encounter then subsequent to this yep. in heaven. Tell us about that. Yeah, so 1999, which is the first summer after this encounter, I was, you know, it's funny, Randy, I, I still wanted to drink and party one more time. I met a guy who was very merciful. I was like, Lord, let me one more time. And every time I said that, I got, I got into so many car accidents that in the summer, all the partying ended after <laughs> And during the season, the Lord allowed me to see, uh, see heaven. Um, it, I didn't know it was heaven until I read the scriptures afterwards. It was the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, uh, 2,000 by 2,000 by 2,000. I forgot the exact unit, but it's in the scripture. It was a big city made of pure gold. Uh, I saw angels for the first time in this choir of angels worshiping God. And their voice was so beautiful that I knew it was no human mortal being. It was a heavenly choir. And then I saw a great ball of light, which kind of rotated like a triangle. But I think God was saying Father, Son, and Spirit. But I also got audibly. And he usually speaks to me in scripture very, very, uh, very specifically. He said, Jesus is my beloved son. I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. And as I saw the new Jerusalem and saw the glory of God, I felt uh, if hell was a hundred times worse of the anxiety, here on earth and heaven was a hundred times the joy the peace uh, the, the fullness of life uh, that he gives you is, is incredible in his presence there's a fullness of joy and i think we can add everything else in your love peace life and it really healed me because i i see heaven more than hell now and whenever i pray when i read the scripture when i before i sleep i think about heaven i think about my home and there's nothing else we need here on earth paul said with food and clothing we shall be it's my life. As long as I have food and clothing, I'm okay. There's not there's no real estate, not one penny, not one bar. And in heaven, 
everything. And it was amazing to see the glory of God and hear his voice. And it's, it's our home, Randy. God is, God is so good. Yes. Amen. Oh, definitely. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm intrigued by how God reveals certain things to, to people based on mm -hmm. what he needs to reveal to them. And Amen. it just strikes me that, so you were, um, you went to actually school, a Buddhist school, I believe in South Korea. Or, Not a Buddhist school, okay. but in, I went to the temple very, very often to meditate eight hours. I even brought my Christian friends there, <laughs> try, try to convert to Buddhism. Yeah. I, rep I repented of that for sure. And then, um, yeah, it was, um, it wasn't a Buddhist school, but I was definitely very involved in the local temples. And some, and that strikes me profoundly. I think there's something to be said about why God showed you his temple in heaven. Oh, interesting. Is, I never thought of it that you way. You worshipped at the temple, the Buddhist temple. And so you saw the, the corrupted aspect of that. Yeah. And that then idols. he showed you the temple of God, the real, the, the temple he built Amen. in heaven. Amen. I mean, the dichotomy there between the yeah. two is <laughs> absolutely striking. Yeah. Why he gave that to you. And, and it just struck me that, yes, you were, you were so focused in the temple uh, as in your youth or your, as a child. And so he, he chooses to show you the temple in heaven. Wow. wow. I never thought of it that way, but that just struck me too. That's very profound on God's part. <laughs> <laughs> he loves us so much, you know, Amen. He just exactly yeah. what we need. You know? um, and yours was, because we've never had anybody really on, and we've interviewed uh, and spoken to so many people who've had uh, near death or afterlife experiences. Right. And none of them had, well, some of them have described these palatial and structures made of stones and brilliant, uh, but nothing, no one has described to us as, as clearly the temple of God. Yeah. And that's the temple that was spoken of in the Old Testament. You talked about even the dimensions right. of the temple, which were very clearly and distinctly defined by God uh, yeah. as the Israelites were building the temple. And you right. saw that. You saw yeah. that. It was yeah. the huge, I believe it was Jerusalem was huge. It's not a tiny temple. It was a big city, just like Jesus describes in the book of Revelation, like prepared like a bride coming down out of heaven. Sure. Streets made of gold and transparent gold, loose gold, and it contains the glory of God. And I don't think it's a permanent home. I, I believe there's a bigger kingdom in heaven, but it's I think it's a millennial kingdom. I'm not really sure exactly how the time fits out, but it was just like the scripture described. Hmm. Did you see Jesus? I've never seen Jesus face to face. I've seen his glory. I've seen his light. I've heard his voice. But I've imagined it, but I've never seen him come to me in, in the white robe and say hi. Every yeah. time he came to me, it was a more glorious visit, a more uh, awe, heavenly awe visit. But I've never seen Jesus where he just walked in and said hello. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I've heard um, his voice many times. It audibly? Yeah. Well, you know, Jesus says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They will not follow a stranger's voice because they know the voice of their shepherd and master. So I've heard his voice in dreams um, when I was awake too in trances. But I think what's most important is we obey his voice after he says whatever he says. <laughs> yeah. That's his love language is obedience. Yeah. Amen. It, it is. It is. Can you tell us uh, something that he uh, spoke to you uh, when you heard, heard Jesus's voice? Yeah, when Jesus speaks to me, it's not something I look for. It's still a silent voice, but there are times when he makes himself more audible. I remember in 2004, I was thrown off my bed and Jesus spoke to me about the pending earthquakes coming to California. That day, I received an email from an email list I'm not even a part of. The intercessors who got thrown off their beds and had this encounter. So there's sometimes Jesus speaks to me about natural disasters, but very rare. Other times he speaks to me about, like for example, just got a church building, Randy, a three million dollar building for free, kind of. And then the Lord spoke to me two months ago that He's gonna give me a building, and I was and I told the whole church, "Hey, God wants to give us a building," and they're like, 
where? Like, how? <laughs> We're so poor. Like, everyone's coming at high school kids, you know, ex druggies, and we just came out of prison and homeless, and you know, they don't fit in the religious church. And I was like, yeah, that's a good question. How? But we got it, you know, two months later. So sometimes he speaks to me, but I think the best uh, day we have with Jesus is the best, where he still he speaks just like Elijah did. He was not in the was not in the wind. He was not fire hailstorm. He was in the still small voice. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, still small voice, and he speaks to us in our heart, and we know it's him because we're his sheep. So yeah, amen. Yes, yeah. yes, you're right, and and uh, you know the of uh, the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. Yeah, uh, you just described a couple of them at least, uh, and that is uh, the word of knowledge. Yep, word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit's imparting to you the church, uh, yep. build the church, and you also have uh, described the prophetic, which yeah, in the prophetic. Greek and Hebrew translations actually is truth telling. Sometimes mm, that's, that's right. foretelling. Sometimes that's just declaring God's truth, and and right. you declared that. As you mentioned, when uh, or you had a foretelling uh, in terms yeah. of the earthquake in Amen. California. So did that did that happen then? Uh, as he, uh, uh, the earthquake has not happened. I don't think the big one because so the prayer group got an answer and they said we're going to intercede and and you know I didn't even pray to be frank with you at the beginning. They they were kind of leading this email chain after all of us a bunch of the same event and. The email said the Lord does not say he will take it away, but that less people get injured, less people will die, but less, less, not complete, get rid of the judgment for more mercy. So we pray for that. It hasn't happened yet. So I think we're still praying. You know, many of us are still praying for mercy over America, California. God desires all men to be saved. Unlike some people, <laughs> God yeah. desires all men to be saved. Yeah. He's, he's very big hearted compared to us. <laughs> oh, immensely so that that's yeah. probably the biggest understatement uh i think steve of the day <laughs> so much yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well and he did you 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 described something i think that is uh is very important and that is uh that even though something may be um predestined by god through intercession it can be altered and that's biblical it you is know, we know that nehemiah uh, prayed and he prayed with the Israelites when they were captive in Babylon. Right. Uh, they prayed for the building of the temple. He prayed for the restoration of the Jewish people in the promised land. And, and of mm -hmm. course that happened. Um, but, you know, it, and we could go through many different examples in, in the Bible, certainly Hezekiah yeah. and what have you of where uh, God, I don't want to say God changed his mind, but God heard the prayers of the saints and then altered what was intended to be or what was going to happen. Yeah, we see that all throughout scriptures, Randy, even when Jesus pretends to pass by or is maybe decided to pass by the woman, she he grabs onto him and says, hey, don't leave. You got to heal my daughter. Come. You know, and yeah. Even the dogs eat the bread that falls off the master's table. And he says, you know what? I wasn't going to heal, but I'm going to heal. According to the faith will be done to you. So you're right. There's a, there's a huge part. It's called sinner. Us and God together. It's not the, like honorages, and we're just God does everything by Himself. He He wants us involved. <laughs> he does. Yeah. He does. There's another thing about your story. I'm going back a little bit, but uh, that I think is uh, very telling, and that is, you became saved, so you were destined to go to heaven. Subsequent to leaving mm -hmm. this world, um, you were saved by the blood of Jesus by virtue of your confession and uh, through faith. Um, mm -hmm. by virtue of what he did on the cross. Yeah. However, when that happened, you still kind of were the, uh, I don't know if you could call it the wild child, but you still <laughs> did stuff that uh, yeah, yeah. you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, I was. Um, like I shared with you earlier in the interview, Randy, I wanted to party one more time. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to live a very sinless life anyway. Why don't I go back to one more party, one more rave, one more nightclub event but every time i went after meeting christ i got into a car accident i got into a big fight over there or something with the people who were drinking so eventually all my non-christian friends started to just disappear and god starts you know very godly friends or people friends in the church other pastors 
So little by little, year after year, I look back on my life. Every year, God would cut. Because we still have two natures. I don't believe in perfect perfection here on this side of heaven. Some people do, like Wesleyans. They believe that. Um, but Methodists, but I believe uh, we have to fight every day. That's why Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me. I believe it's a choice. I believe the more we do it, we get used to it, the more we have. You know, I'm 42 this year, and um, fighting sin is a lot easier than when I was 24. <laughs> but, and, you know, I'm getting older too, maybe. But, uh, but definitely God gives us the grace to live a holy life and to walk the narrow road of life. I think that's the message that we need. And, um, yeah, and I understand when Christians struggle because I was that guy. I made every mistake as a pastor, every mistake in the book. And he still came after me and delivered me from every sin I could not deliver myself from. And Jesus did that to the point where I can, you know, put a camera in my life, in my private life and say, guys, the Lord is with me. Look, but it did not take overnight to get there you know, after two decades. And, and sometimes the Lord still wants us to fight. Then we have to fight. But he gives us the victory at the end. and He gets all the glory. We just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He well, and, and I think that's so important, isn't it, Steve? Because uh, yep. and for anyone that kind of has that question as you know, the Paul struggled with this. We've talked about that right. in the program previously. You know, he okay. struggled about wanting to do the right thing and sometimes not. Yeah. Um, if anyone has wants to go into a deep dive in the scriptures, there is an episode that um, that I had taped, a teaching actually using lots of scripture called nice. "Once Saved, Always Saved?" Question mark. So you can That's go good. back there and you can dive into the scripture. What what Steve is talking about is that he was saved. And so we talk about justification versus sanctification and the difference, awesome. because I think that's very important to very distinguish important. between the walk in Christ, which is the walk toward more Christ-likeness versus the salvation, which is the confession uh, of Jesus as our Lord and Savior and, and being born anew as, as uh, was described by Jesus to Nicodemus. Yep. Uh, so uh, it's very important, to, I think, to, to clearly understand that because Steve, a lot of people that we've that write to us, uh, and we you know get thousands of of letters, or sorry, that's a passe term, thousands of emails and texts, <laughs> what have you, um, that they're afraid of losing losing their salvation, right? In hell, they hear about a hell story like yours, and they think, you know, will God allow me to have that? And just on that latter one, what would you say to somebody that has a question, you know? And yeah, may that's be a, addicted to drugs or something of that nature. Yeah, that's a very good question, Randy, because it, it shows the real struggles we have as saints who are not home yet. I think it describes the ultimate weapon of the devil, which is deception. It tells you, oh, now you're not worthy. Now you're beyond God's reach. I believe when Jesus was talking about those who left the church, it's usually evil cult leaders. We're talking about kings of the earth. He judges people who hate God. I have not met a Christian like that who sincerely desired Jesus and sincerely loses salvation because they sincerely struggle. So, um, you know, I myself got a lot through my struggles as a minister. When I fell, when I failed in ministry, I actually even went through a divorce. My first marriage after 30 days because the lady didn't want to do full-time ministry. <laughs> she's told me that before, but I've been married for five years now to a wonderful woman. And she's a pastor's kid, a lot more, uh, you know, understanding. And I would tell that person that he who began a good work in you will finish it. That John wrote these things that you may know you have eternal life. That, that nothing can separate you from the love of the Father in Jesus. That's what Jesus said in John 10, 31. Nothing, you know, um, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, yes, we get sanctified. Yes, we struggle against sin. But I, that struggle that the individual has, I will to you. That struggle shows that they're real children of God because only children of God struggle against sin. When I was a Buddhist, I never struggled against sin. I didn't even know what sin was. These are things, you know, and you're good enough, but in Christ, you're made perfect by faith, and, and he's our good shepherd, you know. So I believe we're supposed to live with that assurance you know, mm -hmm. with all my heart. Amen. Yes, certainly. You know, your, your story is so profound, Steve, and there's a message that's conveyed uh, hearts have been touched, uh, lives have been changed as a result of your sharing. Um, but I think there's more, and it comes from you. And 
and what you will impart uh, to our audience. I believe the Holy Spirit is leading right now. Uh, the Holy Spirit is leading for the audience that is staying tuned uh, to eradicate the fear of hell. The only way you do that is through Christ, being in Christ. So, um, you know, prayer for, for that, because we do receive messages, Steve, from people just sure. feeling like, you know, I, I, I don't want to go there and I feel like I'm, I'm being tormented, they're having nightmares, mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. um, the other is, you know, prayer of salvation. Maybe there's yeah. an uncertainty, you know, that am I, am I really saved or am I not saved? And it's the genuine one, because in some cases, uh, somebody has not given their heart over. They may be, you know, they're yeah. just giving Jesus a kind of a very surfacey kind of attention. And he's mm -hmm. like one person amongst many people, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> kind of a buffet good. of religions, you know, I'll oh, no, 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 no. And then the third one is the, the ones who are going through suffering. Mm. You know, the ones that are just, and there's so much of that today, isn't there? There is, you know, yeah. What people have gone through. So I believe you have, uh, Stephen, anointing on you to impart freedom and okay. also salvation through, through leading those who do not know our Lord. Uh, so will you lead us in, in prayer? Sure, Randy. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, Prayer is when God moves and we stop moving. <laughs> so, uh, amen. Yes. Uh, amen. Yeah. yeah, Father God, uh, we come boldly into your throne of grace in this time of need. Uh, first of all, thank you for Randy K and what he's uh, people through online ministry, which you're using very profoundly, personally, and powerfully in these last days. And not just me, but we, yeah, we pray for the mighty name of Jesus. For the fear of man anxiety, the spirits that are out of you, to be cast off by your perfect love, Lord. We pray for all those who are struggling with genuine concern for their own salvation, to be set free from that fear, and to know the Jesus Bible who saves all those who fully trust in him. And we pray for those, God, the second group of people who have not given over their whole heart to you. I serve you with maybe even just their lips or a lukewarm heart. I pray. A complete surrender, complete surrender. It's harder to give our own lives, surrender to you. People say it's hard to make you, Lord. It's harder not to Jesus. So Lord God, would you grant the grace to those who want many gods to repent, and to serve Jesus alone with all their hearts. As Joshua confessed, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord God and him alone, and no other idol. And we pray for those who are sincerely struggling in this season. For those who are struggling with pain and suffering and, and torment, even nightmares, are spiritual. as you deliver and heal me, God, time after time, we pray, God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will heal these people, Father, because you are more than able, God. We see you right now with the eyes of our hearts, with the eyes of our spirit, and all in you, Father. You will deliver your people, and you will heal them. Heal us, and we'll be healed. Save us, and we'll be saved. For you are our praise, it says in Psalm 103, 103. We thank you, Lord God, for your amazing grace, your powerful work, God, by the blood of Jesus, by the name of Jesus, by your stripes, healed, spirit, soul, body. I pray that 2022 will be a season of complete restoration and healing and wholeness, deafness, not just wholeness, God, but holiness, humility, tenderheartedness, and gratitude, and continual joy as we walk with you night and day, God. We thank you. For being our pillar of fire by night and our pillar of cloud by day, you will never leave us for We thank you for this anointed ministry where hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, are getting touched. We thank you, God, for using all your glory. You deserve all the glory, Jesus. You are a good and faithful shepherd. We thank you, God, and in Jesus, our mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. And if Amen. you prayed that prayer, um, for the first time or uh, recommitted your life uh, to the Lord, please uh, let us know on randyk.org in the contact page. We want to send you something uh, and we encourage you to find a church, a small group in your area, one that uh, believes in the Bible as the inspired yep. word of God uh, so that you can get plugged in there and start developing these relationships that um that our friend Steve, our, our brother Steve, has, uh, has had enjoyed uh, when his life was saved because they interceded for him. Otherwise, 
um, maybe he wouldn't be with us today Amen. in a different place. Uh, so um, it's important to get plugged in, uh, beloved of the Lord. And uh, also, um, you can, if you have a question for Steve, then you can reach us at uh, that same randyk.org site, uh, contact. We'll make sure that that message gets to uh, Steve so he can respond to you. Any other information that Steve wants to provide to us will be in the body of this uh, the video. And as it goes off, if you're, if you're listening on audio, um, then you can go to YouTube and listen and watch it as well. So um, anyway, uh, Steve, this has been absolutely wonderful. Tell us what you're doing today, where you're at. Yeah, Randy, um, this is a full time for me. Uh, I feel in the presence of God. Uh, nowadays, we're planting churches. Uh, just last night, we led another brother to the Lord. Our church is in the middle of downtown Fullerton. Uh, and the Lord has graciously provided a sanctuary for his one lost sheep to come back. One church. I used to serve in the mega, but left the scene to plant smaller ones for various reasons. And um, yeah, so we're planting churches. I work in IT. <laughs> you know, I, I had to work because my wife is like, you cannot live. So I work. I'm a bivocational pastor. Uh, served as a chaplain, too, in the military. And then now, uh, yeah, just working in IT, loving on my wife. And, and may, uh, we have a leadership tomorrow. So very excited to get all these to become disciple makers themselves. So, yeah. Amen. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, um, well, uh, we're going to have it. If you're watching, well, if you're watching this or listening, we have just concluded our afterlife virtual live stream where we had uh, 20 some odd speakers and John Burke wow, and Sid Ross and everybody together. However, wow. here's the good news. A couple of pieces. We may find a way that you can watch that. Um, mm -hmm. We are um, going to be inviting uh, Steve to what we're planning now, far in advance, the on-site First Christian Afterlife Conference. Wow. Uh, we've got three different locations right now that we're looking at, one back east in, uh, in South Carolina, one in Texas, and one in my backyard of uh, San Diego, California. San Diego. So uh, we'll decide, you know, which one uh, people want to get to. We may do all three. So mm -hmm. you can go to the randyk.org for more information about that. And that way uh, you'll get to meet uh, all of these phenomenal people uh, who are sharing our, their uh, accounts with us uh, in person. And, uh, and we can pray with you in person and all of that. So we want to stay in touch with you. Steve, again, this has been phenomenal, and thank you thank so you, much for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure, Randy. God bless you guys, and thank you for doing. I had a wonderful time myself. Amen. Thank you. And God bless you, and God bless our audience. So, the good, great news is, if you are in Christ, be of good cheer, <laughs> because heaven is in your future. <laughs> yeah. Until next time, God bless. Amen. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.